I am unashamed. What about you? Welcome back to Unashamed. We uh, still down here in the southern lair. Zach, we got Zach with us. Zach, it's good to have you it's good back to be in here. the fold. Yeah, it's good to be here. When you're, when you're off doing your... We had a hot open, that which, which, which helped the whole team. We did. A hot open. That's right. We had a, well, we had a cold open and a hot open well, because right. Jay's told a fishing story, and then you told the fishers a men's story, so yep. it all worked out. I, I do want to mention um, – Several of you have asked me about one of my buddies, Brian Robinson, sent me and Jay some of these hats that I'm wearing. And I looked into it because a lot of you have been asking about it. You can get them. Uh, They're at 611 Armory is the name of the website. And Brian gives all the money that he makes from selling these hats to missions. And a lot of it goes to One Kingdom, which is one of our missions. So if you want to purchase one of these, it has the gospel symbols on it. You can. Um, good guys, good hearts. I think if you use the code Al or Unashamed, you get 15% off as well. So check them out if you want to do that. Also, while I'm while I'm doing a little commercial for us, don't forget, uh, Dad's got a new book coming out uh, that's going to release on March the 12th. I Could Be Wrong, But I Doubt It is the name of the book. And there's I Could Be Wrong, But I Doubt It.com. You can pre-order there, or you can go to uh, Phil Robertson Book. Uh, as well, Phil Robinson book, I think, dot com uh, to sign up and get a, a signed copy there as well. So uh, check that out. And also our cooking segments, uh, which are on blaze TV dot com slash Robertson is where to go to get those. Jace has one coming up on crappie, uh, which will be out as well. And we got some new ones. Uh, Not the two and a half pound crappie, though. It wasn't. A, you didn't cook the two and a half pound crappie, did you? No, he had some regular size crappie, I guess. Jace. Well, I actually. Right? Uh, well, I'll let you see the story. I won't give away what happened there, but we it was an interesting thing. We we treated some new Louisiana residents who came via California to some Louisiana cuisine. And I started with the crappie. Cuz you don't want to miss that. <laughs> You've never eaten a crappie in your life. Stop what you're doing. You've missed out. And go catch some. You can't buy them because that would be illegal. So it's interesting, Jace, because you were talking about the the crappie in the last episode, and the same last night, a friend of mine down here who is a he does kayak fishing in the uh, in the lagoon, and um, so he catches trout, uh, flounder, uh, white whitings. Uh, they ca- they catch off the beach, which are all delicious fish, and so. He had caught some and then uh, cooked them up for us last night. So we had fish as well. You were a party of one. We were a party of five. But I do love some fish down here as well. Man, they got some great fish when you get on the coast. So that's something we can all agree on. So you all ready to get to Acts 3? We never, we, we, uh, we I've were been waiting. tending to get there last time. <laughs> Acts 3 and 4. Dad's hot take turned into a whole podcast. So. And it's fine. I mean, there are things that come up on an overview. We're just doing an overview of Acts, so so right. subjects come and go. Uh, but I do think you have to look at the big picture here, and we keep reminding everyone that this is a moment in history, roughly 2,000 years ago, where Jesus ascended. And when you think about what happened, because where they're at in 3 and 4, they're standing on the steps of the old temple. You know, when you just read the first verse of chapter three, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. You read chapter four and verse one, because what happens there is going to cause quite the response. The priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter while they were speaking to the people. So, You have a place in history where an introduction of a new temple, when you think about what is a temple, where God and humans meet in the Old Testament, you can read all about it. And even getting a picture of the garden in the beginning was God dwelling with humans. And so now here's Jesus being resurrected and eating fish post-resurrection he now has a a body that is imperishable you say how do you know that because that was 2,000 years ago and he's at the right hand of God currently 
So you see this new creation that was an earthling who is now in heaven. Just think about that. Earth, something from this earth has now been regenerated in a way. I don't even know the word for that. Whatever you call Jesus's new body. And it is representing that earth can be transformed into the heavenly. And then he pours out his spirit. And now you have earthlings who can house the spirit of God, which is from heaven. And you see this kind of a interlocking between heaven and earth in the current situation we now live in. Now they were on the steps of the temple, but they, for once, was was the temple. Well, that's what I'm saying. So I'll read this. Uh, it, yeah, really, Jace, it became, you're so right, it became ground zero for this new movement. And, and look, they could have met anywhere. They didn't have to meet there. I mean, they didn't have to keep going in there every day, and yet that's exactly where they decided to do it. And I think there was no accident from that, Jason. I think you're exactly right. That was very purposeful that there was a now a visual image of what the new temple and new kingdom is going to look like, and it's how not going to be like the old system. How do we explain the, the fact that that thing was destroyed and they – the gold melted down around the thin, and then they, 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 the, the Roman army got after that gold because they were told not to tear it down. But, but they, they brought it down to what's left over there now, just a one, one part of the wall. But I right. mean, they, that, that attack, I'm just wondering how the sons and daughters of God escaped this thing. The death of it, I mean, they were slaughtered. I mean, thousands that died. But wherever is God's temple there? Well, that's why that's why you those passages we studied in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where Jesus warned them exactly what was going to happen and what to look for, they got out of there. The the Christians saw it coming. I mean, they, well, they had had yeah, forty years exactly. of knowing. That's why Jesus. And they did get out of there. I mean, they, and they, they got they, out of yeah. there. Uh, you know, it's interesting though you, you, how the, this epicenter here in Acts three is still at the temple. You know, obviously this is all you know uh, coming to a, to an end. But um, I was thinking about Mark chapter two. You've got this. Uh, this is Jesus. It's just so, it's just so such a uh, a great example of of how the Jesus got, was kind of, got out of the temple. <laughs> he got out of the temple in Mark too. He he he. And, and uh, they were he, the temple, but nobody knew who they were. I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, they said we're going to kill them all. We're going to kill everyone. Take this whole thing. But if they didn't get the people who were the new kingdom with Peter and all of them, well, they they the Almighty saved them by the skin of their teeth. I mean, that's it. They barely got out of there because if they had stayed. Whew. Yeah, but you also see their boldness and courage yeah. in three and four here because worst case scenario, even if they die, they're going to be resurrected. Yeah. That, that's what the power yeah. of the Holy Spirit does. Go ahead, Zach, Mark 2. Oh, I was thinking Mark 2, you got a scene that Jesus leaves the temple and goes into the, a desolate place. So he goes out, and this is such the nature of the kingdom of God, by the way, that the kingdom's going outward. Uh, but Jesus goes out and he heals the leper um, who would have obviously been cast out of the temple, would not have been able to participate in the temple. And Jesus goes out to that guy, heals him, and he tells him to go back into the temple. So you even see this emphasis of how Jesus uh, takes our place, even in like, I mean, it's, uh, this is all like part of the, the the scheme of redemption that Jesus has taken the place of the leper and then sending the leper back into the temple. And and I, I, I think that when you get to the book of Acts, I mean, you start to see a lot of this kind of unfold because this is all post-resurrected uh, Jesus. And so what is it? This, we're not, this is this is everything we talked about to uh, Al's point. We we talked a whole lot about, you know, Mark and and uh, and Luke and, and Matthew's accounts of of the Christ and particularly when it comes to the temple and the coming of the kingdom. 
But now we're in a, a, a historical period in the text that we're in now. This is after Jesus has been crucified. This is after Jesus's ministry was com- complete on earth. This is after his burial, after his resurrection, and after his ascension. Um, so you're actually seeing these things come now in power with the Holy Spirit. And uh, and it is obviously going to cause quite the stir. Some people say that the book of Acts is um, when the world turned upside down. Yeah. And I just wanted to reiterate, I've read this before, but just this is not something we've made up. You know, when Paul addressed the Ephesians in chapter 1, in verse 9, he talks about the mystery of, of the gospel being revealed, which he purposed in Christ, and in verse 10, to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. He goes on to say in verse 19, that power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly heavenly realms, which he goes on to say God, in verse 22, God placed all things under his feet, appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body. Then specifically to the temple in chapter 2, in verse 19, he says we're members of God's household. We're built on the foundation of the apostles. We're fixed to read about what Peter and John just did. And prophets, they're going to point to saying all the prophets were about Jesus. And so then continuing in verse 20 of Ephesians 2, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. We're fixed to specifically read that being quoted in Acts 3. In him, the whole building, this is verse 21 of Ephesians 2, rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. Well, who is this whole building? It's spirit-filled people because of verse 22. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So that's what's happening at the old temple in Acts 3 and 4. You have spirit-filled people, the foundation of our church. And just as just to, uh, I said it was in Acts 3, but in Acts 4, when they are being threatened Peter says in verse 10 it is by the name of Jesus of Nazareth whom you crucified but whom God raised from the dead and this man stands before you, that this man stands before you heal because they're fixed to have a healing here in chapter 3 he is the stone you builders rejected which has become the cornerstone which is a quote from Psalm 118 now that's good Jay's and that's exactly, and then he says right after that, salvation is found in no one else. And so, which you know, is really, yeah, I think what caused this boldness and courage, because it says when they saw the courage, verse 13, because that verse 12 is, is such a universal statement. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Well, this is what caused them to be agitated. This was not well received by some of the listeners. Now, it was to some because in chapter four, it's amazing. And we hadn't even read what happened yet. But, you know, they're going to be threatened and they're going to be hauled off to jail for what they're preaching, which was Jesus. But in verse four of chapter four is a little nugget. It says, but many who heard the message believed and the number of men grew to almost five Thousand. Yeah, I saw that yeah. the other night when I was looking at this. It said 5,000. So that's a yeah. good setup for the story. Do you want to read the story in Acts 3? Yeah, yeah, I'll read. Let's, uh, let's take a break. So, Dad, uh, Mom has uh, always called you her pioneer man. And she says from when she was a young age, she loved reading books about the old West. And she always knew she would marry a pioneer man, a man that could take care of her. Uh, from the land. Do do you see yourself as that sort of guy? I've spent a long, long, long time my whole life in the woods. There's just just some peace in there that I like. And look, you've shown us that, you know, we can survive 
uh, basically on what we see around us, and uh, we don't always have to depend on other people. That's correct. Our friends at My Patriot Supply have that same sort of mindset. Um, their mindset is is that they want to protect you and provide, even if everything that's kind of the normal life, something happens, and there's some great emergency, there's some you know storm that happens. Uh, they're going to have some things there provided for you that you can turn to. They have a four-week emergency food kit. Uh, it's got 16 food and drink varieties, uh, which is great, 2,000 calories per day. Uh, these meals last up to 25 years in storage. So they're going to provide you with self-reliance uh, from My Patriot Supply. You can stock up on all the food kits your family needs at the website, preparewithphil.com. Get each ready hour, four week food kit for $60 off. Also, you get free shipping. So you can protect yourself, your people, your family, and be ready for anything. Start preparing at preparewithphil.com. That's preparewithphil.com. All right. So we're in Acts chapter three. And I call this Jesus 2.0 because it's really interesting that now once this thing is established and we got thousands of people now that are a part of this new thing, Holy Spirit is is doing his thing. And Peter and John really do exactly what Jesus was doing right before he left up until the point of his crucifixion and resurrection and ascension. So here's Acts 3.1. Uh, one day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon, which again, with Luke, he gives you such specifics, which I love. It, it kind of gets you in the story. Now, a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful. Right off the bat, you see this kind of irony because here's this guy crippled from birth. So everybody knows this isn't a guy that hey, I'm, I'm down in my back. I mean, everybody has known this guy. He's been this way his whole life and he's being carried and he's being set down at a, a gate called beautiful. And, I, and I've thought about this before. He's anything but beautiful. This is a sad reminder of what happens to people. But what's about to happen is beautiful where he was put every day to beg from those going to the temple courts. So that's how he's eating, is begging, and everybody's known this guy. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. And every time I see this, I think about when you pull up at a red light and there's someone there and they're, you know, panhandling for money. You, you don't want to make eye contact because you, you're afraid you're going to probably give them some money. And how many times have people avoided that direct look, right? But they've got something else in store for them. Then Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have. But what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And here's Jay's where you can tell whether it's a miracle or not. Instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong. And remember, he's been crippled since he was born. I don't know how old he was. People have guessed. No, know, maybe no, we this, know how old he was. In, in four twenty, in four twenty-two, uh, he said he was over forty years old. There you go. He was over so, 40. so when the story goes on, it says for the man who was miraculously healed was over forty years old, which I think so is. Was, profound because he had been crippled from birth yep. and everybody knew who he was and he had a system going which it makes us uncomfortable because the name was of the gate was called beautiful so you see what he yeah. was doing yeah he was tapping on people's emotions like you yep. rightfully said al when people when you pull up at a red light or whatever and here's somebody sitting there and they have a sign and i heard a guy say this because this sounds mean but I'm going to share it because I think it's kind of funny and, and it, it helps you realize that number one, we always have something to give people in these situations, yeah. which is Jesus. And it's better than money yeah. and it may seem crazy. So, but I heard a guy who like us believes that these apostles had this miraculous ability. So he was saying in light of this, well, we, it would be nice to go on every street corner and do miracles. But 
kind of taking the verse where I read in Ephesians, where in, in Ephesians 2, where he says, you know, after we're saved by grace, not not from us in and of ourselves. But then he says, so that we can work. He said, because we are God's workmanship. And so he did an illustration and he said, we might not can heal the guy on the street corner. We might not can say, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. He said, but we can say, in the name of Jesus, get up and work. So if you want to try that, <laughs> and it's not work as in you're thinking, hey, this guy needs a job, because that's usually what you think. But it's saying that Jesus can save a person, any person, all people. There's no other name under heaven what by which we be saved. And we are called to work. And that spirit yeah. is still working, even though it might be not in the miraculous, because just like uh, yesterday, I was in the grocery store. This was a funny story. And I got blindsided by a person who had listened to the podcast and said, you know, you, you was talking about those miracles. It was like just out of nowhere. You know, you were talking about those miracles. And uh, they started saying, well, I was raised in a church, you know, where if you didn't do miracles, you were you were considered faithless and doubtless. Now, look, in that moment, I could have gone and, and started having an argument about miracles, which is kind of was our point in the last podcast. We talked about it, it on the podcast. Right. Even about baptism. But I just said, but look at the big picture. Look at the big picture. Who were the miracles pointing toward? And I'm using this, what happened yesterday, as an example that in any situation, in any confrontation, whether it's something religious or there's something like this, we can give people Jesus. We give them the big picture. It's like those miracles were pointing people to Jesus. Our whole point is don't miss Jesus. Of course, I just got a dumbfounded response. But still, I just thought I'm not going to be able to have this philosophical argument about the role of miracles. And so then he just said, well, do, I have one question. Do you believe in miracles? And I said, absolutely. Mm. But I, because I believe in the miracle giver. And I said, all those miracles you read about, those of us who have the Holy Spirit of God, we are going to experience those miracles. And he said, well, how? I said, the same way when Jesus was, was resurrected. I mean, his body was dead and then it was alive. And that's going to happen to every one of us. So we're not saying that miracles are not going to happen and that miracles right. hadn't happened. Oh, they're happening. This is what the promise of the resurrection ultimately is, which I believe is the greatest miracle, because that's mm -hmm. one that's going to trigger you to live forever and ever. So don't misunderstand. And Paul would agree with you in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, without that, none of the rest of it even matters. So... You're right. That's the ultimate miracle that points to Jesus is the fact of the resurrection, his and then ours. Which exactly. Is I mean, you go ahead and just knock yourself out. You can lose an arm. You can lose a leg. You can do it, do it you know, working for the kingdom. But I'm telling you, it, at some point, you're going to be able to say, look at my hands and my feet. I was dead. But now look. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. We're, we're going to have that happen to us. So, so Jace, it's interesting because this brings up an interesting point because we brought it up about kind of in the modern era with, with panhandlers or people trying to, you know, get money for whatever reason. Uh, you know, and you say, well, you, everybody has to be the same. You got to give everybody the same. You got to treat everybody the same or it's not fair. Can you walk past 49 people and give to number 50 and you did something wrong because you passed 49? John and Peter on their way into the temple I can guarantee you they walk past a bunch of beggars before they pass this guy because they were all over the place. We saw it the same with Jesus and they didn't do wrong by not healing everybody along the way. They just saw this guy. And because of now we know what's about to happen and about to read, they decided they wanted to get a crowd together to hear about Jesus. And so they knew how to do that. They stopped at the guy who's over 40 that everybody knows, and they decide they're going to heal him. 
And what's well, exactly. ironic is the guy, all he wanted was money. But what he got was way better than money. Way better. And he was an example that God used to show that Jesus is Lord. He's at the right hand. He died for the sins of the world, and you can live again. Because this, this beggar eventually probably died of something else. He did. No doubt about so it. So that, that's, that's why we keep harping on, look, it's great when God works in your life and, and he makes you more comfortable on the earth. And it happens. You know, that's why we pray and we do these things. But don't miss the bigger picture. You living forever with God is, is the greater happening. That's it. And this miracle, we know now the reason why it happened is so thousands of people would come to know Jesus. Let's take another break. So let me finish reading this, uh, what happens, uh, and kind of what gets to that sermon we were talking about. In verse 8, it says, the man, so now his ankles and feet are strong. Imagine, it's 40 years he's been toted around. And now all of a sudden he jumped to his feet and began to walk. But I love it. He wasn't just walking like he was walking the runway at the model, you know, deal. He went with them in the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God, which I always get a chill every time I read this text, because imagine that this guy is doing jumping jacks. He's high-fiving people. I mean, like, he's been laying there for 40 years, not able to walk, and now all of a sudden he's completely restored. And you notice he went into the temple courts. This is the new temple going yeah. into what will become the old temple and, and the right. temple that will be no more. This is exactly right. A place where he couldn't have been any other way. And and in that you see here uh, uh, when the Bible says that the kingdom will come in power, um, when, he, when he opens the book of Acts with that, that the kingdom is going to come in power. This this is like you kind of see the two contrasts of the two yeah, what, 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 where's more power at? This guy that's been healed or the structure that's going to come down in just a few years? Yeah, it's you a great you point. see a power dynamic shifting right here. Yeah, and think about it. You're right, Zach, because while this is happening, they're still trading and they're selling their doves and people are going in and making their sacrifices. And the priest, he's on this shift, he's on that shift. Like the normal business of the priesthood is still going on, but the power is happening out here at the beautiful gate where a guy just was healed and is jumping and skipping and high-fiving everybody and praising yeah, it's, God. And it's kind of like in our in our life, you see this same thing manifest itself in the kingdom. You don't have to do a whole lot of like uh, what what we call apologetics and defenses of the of the Christian faith. Even what we were talking about in the last podcast. I mean, Jace in the in, in between podcasts was like, I don't I don't debate baptism. I mean, I, I preach Jesus, and I think that's such a good thing. Like because when you see the you know, when you see the kingdom moving, it, it doesn't, you don't have to put all these parameters around it. It, it just comes in power. It kind of speaks for itself. And you just kind of like, I mean, you don't, people ask you what's going on. It's not. And I think that's kind of what's happening, unfolding here is this kingdom is coming and it's starting to, to bleed into places that the most unlikely of places. And I'm sure people looked at this as thought, wow, what's going on? You know, the, what, what is this? What is happening here? Yeah. And so verse nine is why that it happened. It says, when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And so then verse 11 says, while the beggar held on to Peter and John, because like you can imagine he's not wanting to, he's, he's like, yeah. these are the guys that heal me. I'm with them. All the people were astonished. And here's the purpose and came running to them in the place called Solomon's colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, men of Israel, why does this surprise you? So the whole purpose is to gather a crowd of people so they can now hear what Peter's about to preach. And that was the purpose of the miracle. So the crowd would gather, which they did. I'll say keep reading. All right, let's go. Um, he says, why do you stare at us uh, as if by our own power or godliness, we had made this man walk, which was kind of this whole point. We've been talking about, about the miracles, right? It's not about yeah. us. It's about God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus. 
You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. So he's going to go right back to the same message that he had preached earlier in Acts chapter 2. You disown the holy and righteous one and ask that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. <laughs> it's like, it's like, I'm like, wait, this is the same guy that denied Christ three times. I mean, you, you want to know about the power of the resurrection? Oh, what can, how, how can it change a man? I mean, this is beyond bold. I mean, this is, I mean, think about what he's saying here. Oh, yeah, that, that, that 316. Uh, I mean, uh, that three fifteen is quite a statement because he says you, quite a you statement. killed the author of life. That's one of those record scratch statements. <laughs> yeah. right. You killed the author of life. It takes you back to that John one when he's like, yeah. "In the beginning was the word. Nothing that yep. has been created that has been created was created without Jesus." And it's like you. Well, how would he die? Well, he didn't, because he then he goes on. But then he also says, "Notice that we are witnesses of this," which I've made a huge deal about this because it keeps coming up. You want to talk yeah. about one of the themes of Acts over and over? They're not saying we want to argue about theology or philosophy, and we we want to tell you about Jesus. And it's not what we think about Jesus; it's that we saw. Jesus come back from the dead. We saw this. We're witnesses. It's yeah, a fact. It, it is. And I and I love that 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 you're right, Zach, that this man who was so doubting before now is so bold because of what's happened and because of the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's what's changed. Well, I mean it's in there and it's verse fifteen. I mean, too, it's it's the reason why Peter's so bold is because, well, they killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead and Peter's saying I was a witness to that. I mean I that, saw it. That that encounter alone is I mean I mean think about if you're the because the one thing you would fear more than anything, I mean more than political persecution uh, social marginalization, cultural isolation, you know, all of that, um, even, even physical torment and pain and all the, the worst that anybody can do to you is, is to kill you and to say, we're just going to end your life. And, and to see that happen to the one who you put your hope in had to have been extremely devastating. But I, but, but then to see that death conquered, um, at the resurrection, I'm sure that that must have emboldened Peter in a way that that well, we're seeing it unfold here, and that's why I think that he really was bold here. And notice the, what he's notice what he's saying too, though. In all of this, it's what we've been talking about the whole time about the kingdom. And uh, Jason mentioned a few podcasts back about reading the Bible backwards. We had a really good podcast on that. You should go back and find it. But it's the idea that in the Old Testament. It's all of this stuff is understood in Jesus. And so he's essentially telling them that, you know, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our father, all the Old Testament, all those guys, uh, all, all of those were pointing to Jesus. All of those were pointing to Jesus, but you killed him. The, the one that came from the prophets. I mean, he, he's, he's going back and pointing back and saying, you guys missed it. You guys missed what the prophets uh, foretold. And he's going to kind of keep, I'll go on and say that here in just a few verses. Like you missed the Old Testament, you misunderstood it. Well, which yeah, and they would totally get it now that it yeah. makes sense once they see it. Let's take another break. So in verse uh, sixteen, uh, he says, after he says, "We are witnesses of this." And by the way, that bolsters what we were talking about about them having the power to impart this miraculous because you had to have seen it to really be trusted with this much power to be able to put it back where it belongs. That's why he says in verse 16, it's not about us yeah. by faith in the name of Jesus. This man whom you see and know was made strong. In other words, it's not us. It's the second time he said it. It is in Jesus's name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him as you now can all see. Yeah, there's a there's a, a pretty contentious debate on authority inside the church, and um, particularly when it comes to what's called apostolic authority. Like what what it, what would what would give someone apostolic authority, um, an apostolic leadership, 
you know, people call themselves apostles today. I would be in the camp, I think, that would say that apostolic authority came from those who actually walked with Christ that Christ gave it to. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, and so, so they were witness. You know, first Corinthians nine one says that. And I feel bad because he said, Are we not eyewitnesses of the resurrected Lord? And he's, yeah. that's why we're making such a big deal. But I hate getting into this just because I said I'm not going to argue about baptism. I'm not going to argue about miracles. I'm only going to argue about Jesus. But now I find myself discussing this. But to to get back in the grocery store yesterday, that question came up of because he said this guy had left his buddy, had left his, the church that he was involved in because they said he didn't have enough faith because he wasn't doing miraculous powers. And he was like, well, I'm trying. I love Jesus, but it's not happening. And they, they were saying, well, you're, you're out. And so he left. So that was the situation. What I didn't say yesterday, which I'll say right now, is the reason we keep highlighting all these examples about the apostles doing this, and in the last two podcasts, uh, we brought that out. But even in Acts 2, 43, it says, Every woman was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. The Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit fell, it said, Are these men, are not all these men Galilean, Galileans? Well, those were the apostles. Look at chapter 5 and verse 12. The apostles performed many mirac miraculous signs and wonders among the people. You see, even in Acts 3 and 4, Peter and John, they healed this guy. Well, guess what? They were apostles. So when you get to 1 Corinthians 12, and I'll just make this one point and move on, that when you have a letter written to a group of people who had gotten these miraculous gifts via the hands of the apostles, which we went through Corinthians, and you can go look up those podcasts. He gets down to verse 12 of 12, and he said the body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we're all given the one spirit to drink. But then he goes on to say in verse 27, you are the body of Christ, each one of you is a part of it, and in the church, God has appointed, first of all, apostles. Well, he separates them. You say, well, who were the apostles? They were eyewitnesses to the resurrected Lord, and they definitely had the power passed on from Jesus himself via the Holy Spirit to do miracles. But then if something interesting happens in verse 29, because he goes through the different gifts and, and the different people there. And then he asks this question, are all apostles? He's talking about in the church. Are all apostles? What is the understood answer? No. No. Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? What's the answer? No. No. So, you know, I hate to pick on somebody because I don't know the context of that, and I'm not. But for a guy to be a member of a church, and he loves Jesus, and he wants to get his family and friends to be resurrected and live forever with God, to look at him and say, well, you don't have enough faith because you're not doing a miracle, based on what I just read, I think would be bad advice. Yeah, because you're ha you have an expectation that the Bible's pretty clear can't be fulfilled in that way, and so that's a, that's a rough way to treat well, people. And, and I think it, this matters too beyond even just what we're talking about with miracles. That this apostolic authority by which Peter is preaching right here, I would add, and by which Peter wrote um, First and Second Peter, and by which Paul wrote Romans and Galatians and Ephesians. And it's, it, it's the apostolic authority as well that gave way to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to speak the scripture. So when these guys wrote scripture, when they wrote these letters, these are, these are binding. These aren't like, uh, Oh, this is Paul's interpretation. You know, th Oh, this is what, this is what Peter thought about the whole thing. Oh, this, th these are, these are inspired scriptures. And so 
when they speak here in the Bible, this goes to the inerrancy of Scripture and the authority of Scripture. They're speaking on behalf of God here. When we read these words, we're reading the words of God. And we don't possess that type of authority on earth right now. There's nobody that, that's going to supersede anything that's written here. There's no one that's going to hear directly from God and say, I, God said do this, that's going to supersede what's written in Scripture. Well, um, that's right. Think, but Zach, but still at the same time, we're reading this and we believe with all our heart that this is the infallible word of God. This is God speaking. And so I believe in this miracle just as much as if I was standing there seeing it. Yeah. yeah. I believe this happened. I, so when, I too. I'm not going around in my life saying I need a miracle sign or wonder because I have hundreds of them that I'm reading about and getting excited about. And I'm jumping up and down with this guy. You know, when I was reading this last night on yeah. my couch, I was like, this <laughs> is awesome. So when people <laughs> say, you know, are you looking for a miracle? I'm like, oh, I'm looking for a bunch of them every time I read them. And it excites me. But you have to realize, and I made this point last podcast, and I think it's really important, that God called us to suffer as he did Jesus for the sins of the world so that hearts could be humbled. And we're going to suffer for doing this, and they're, they're fixing to suffer for doing this because not only are they threatened, they're, they're taken to jail. Now, granted, they got out of this situation, but others they didn't, and That's eventually right. they died. Yeah, well, they're going to suffer because when you read what Peter's saying here, it's like you're not going to come out there and say what Peter is saying and not suffer because he is he is very directly challenging everything that they held as their core central belief. He, I mean, he's challenging it here, and he's and he's accusing them of crucifying the one that they had hoped to put their hope in. Yeah, and it's interesting because he kind of flips the script. So let me let me let's take our last break and then I'll read the rest of this stuff. So when you to your point, Zach, he start the other one, you know, he he well he starts out men of Israel in Acts two, but then he gives them that Old Testament background, then he comes back directly to them again. And this one he just starts out right there. You did it, you killed him. You had a chance to spare him. You didn't. So he's appealing to their conscience. And now, very brilliantly, he's now going to add some more Old Testament flavor. Remember back in the first one, he quoted David and he quoted Joel. Now he's going to quote Moses and he's going to quote Abraham. Here's what he says in verse 17. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. By the way, there's that's a pretty bold statement. Yeah. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ or Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God. So he gives them the same answer as he did before. Repent, change, turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. I think that's a reference to the Holy Spirit. And that he may... Al, before you read on, I look, I, I found that also found that word very intriguing. So I looked it yeah. up in the Greek, and a few podcasts ago, I told you how to do that. I just typed in Acts three in verse where was that nineteen, at? 19. and wouldn't you know it that that's the only time that word is used in the New Testament. Really, and so which which was kind of shocking to me because yeah. I said I want to see you know, what this word is and what it means. And so I did a real deep dive on that Greek word. I actually practiced to say it, but I've forgotten my practice, so I'm not going to butcher the, <laughs> butcher the word. But uh, it gave the picture of it's when you catch your breath, and uh, uh, which made me think of a lot of things. You know, it's like you just picture somebody drowning yeah. And and not to throw the, the law, being under the law, under the bus. But that's basically what it was intended to do, to realize that you're not going to be able to make it. And I thought about that when you catch your breath, even in sports all the years that I played, every time I got my the breath knocked out of me, in the moment, everybody's like, oh, he just got the your his breath knocked out of him. That is one of the most scary things that oh, yeah. can ever happen to you in life. <laughs> you're right. like, I'm you think you're dying. Die. And then you're yeah. looking at people and they're like, oh, yeah, you just got the wind knocked out of him. 
And when you finally get that breath, like picture drowning, picture getting hit in the gut, you're like, <gasps> and then I thought, okay, I get it. I understand why he used that word. That's because good. that is what he was trying to portray on what Jesus offers you. You're, you're literally coming out of this, this what what you were taught, because that's why he said, I know you're, uh, you acted in ignorance because of your leaders. But when you transform that to our current lives and what we're taught and whatever we think, you know, just finding yourself what is right and true. And, and then all of a sudden you hear Jesus and what he offers. It is literally like you have this moment of, oh, yeah, I, I can live. I have a purpose. I can live forever. I have a message now. I, I I can get courage and boldness. So I just wanted to make a point about that. No, and you actually there. that actually confirms even more that my gut told me that it's I think it's the Holy Spirit. And I think that word you remember when Jesus it, it said at the end of Luke he breathed on them? Yeah. And then they understood the scriptures. That same kind of concept, I think. I, I thought the same thing. You know, you get God's spirit. It is it's you you get your breath back. You do. That's right. A breath of fresh air. So, and then he says, um, times of refreshing may come from the Lord and that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. So now he's talking about his return. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. So now he's going back for God, for Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among, among his people. And he said that way back in Deuteronomy. And, of course, he was talking about this moment. Indeed, all the prophets from Samuel on, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. Now he's going to quote Abraham or what was said to Abraham. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. That's from Genesis 22. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. And that's that, that's quite the sermon. Well, it was more than a lecture. You know, because you think, what made the lecture powerful? What made it powerful is when he connected, and he said it two different times, that all the prophets were pointing to Jesus. This was about Jesus, which is pretty incredible. You know, even yeah. he has this quote about uh, from Deuteronomy about Moses when he said he'll send a prophet. Well, who is he talking about? He's talking about Jesus coming. I mean, when he mentioned Samuel, uh, I thought I jotted this down. Second Samuel seven sixteen, yeah, which is to tie in the kingdom, which we're going to get back to as we continue through Acts. Yeah, that's the Davidic covenant that he made, that he was relaying through Samuel. Yeah, is, is the text you're talking about? Yeah, that. I was going to read it real quick. Um, yeah, seven sixteen, because it's a good one. It says, "Now we're going so far back." Thousands of years, 716, if I could only find 16. Oh, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And he yep. had just said, Jesus must remain in heaven, verse 21 of 3, until the time comes for God to restore everything. He's been exalted. I mean, we're going back to Samuel, to Moses, to Abraham. To David, you could go to, to Joel. yeah, Joel. You could go to Jeremiah thirty-one, thirty-three. See the mm -hmm. same thing. But what I noticed, all those guys had in common, even Daniel two, Daniel seven, yep. Daniel yep. nine. Did you notice the similarity that all of those men? Here's Moses, who, you know, had some kind of speech impediment. You had, uh, uh, you had Jeremiah. You remember that famous verse in in. 20 and verse 9 where he says because everyone was persecuting him no one was responding to his message and he said you know if i say i won't speak anymore in his name yeah i can't help it his word is like a fire in my bones when you think of daniel 
and and this threat to be uh, in amongst the book of Daniel, where these people who wouldn't shut up about God or wouldn't kneel to the current king, they're like, we're going to put you in the fiery furnace. And here today, you got Peter and John healing someone. And then what we'll get to next time in chapter four, when they, they didn't know what to do with them. And they said, well, you just need to stop speaking about this. Yeah. And he comes up with that famous uh, verse. I wanted to read it where he said, oh, we just, we just can't help it. Uh, where is that at? Let me find it right here. Yeah, here we go. In chapter four and verse 18, then they called them in again, and we'll talk about this next week, and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. So you see a common theme, even even the prophets talking, predicting about Jesus and them being told to shut up by the leaders of the nation. And here we got here. These are people who believe in God. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, stop, stop this, because we don't believe this. And it made me really think what we ought to talk about next time is everyone has a cornerstone because he gets to that in chapter four. And if it's not Jesus then when people who have Jesus as the cornerstone start speaking, you want to shut them up. And it may be something good. It may be religion. It may be your career. Or, but if it's a threat, you, you don't want to hear it. That's right. Now, I, and if I had to apply one word to it, Jason, it would be unashamed because we're unashamed of the gospel, but also Jesus is unashamed of us to call us brothers and sisters. So we'll pick up in uh, Acts 4 uh, next time on Unashamed Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.